Hello everybody and welcome to Dot to Dot. Today I have some very interesting uh, things to show you about the Knights Templar, about some of the things that may have happened to them in Europe, and this is inspired by uh, the recent episode of Oak Island where they go to Portugal, and uh, the, the basic premise of this is the Knights Templar actually reestablished them in Portugal. And this is brought forth by theorist Corian, and he takes the fellowship over there, and they discover a few things. Well, I'm going to perhaps show you a little bit more about Portugal, the Knights Templar, and why they were there, why they may have went to Oak Island, and uh, some interesting aspects about history and what may, they may have gone through. So uh, where I left off last time in my last video, and this ties in very nicely to this, is I showed this document here. And this document is from a gentleman named Her Henry Lincoln, who basically wrote the book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And his theory was that the Knights Templar uh, basically were in what was called the Priory of Zion. And the Priory of Zion was to safeguard the uh, Divine Feminine, which was the bloodline of Jesus Christ through Mary Magdalene. And of course, uh, uh, Brown took off on that and wrote and made a movie called The Da Vinci Code. And basically, his whole premise starts with this little symbol right here. And in my last video, I showed this symbol could also be connected to Oak Island, and that it also forms a star. Now, the star has a symbolic message. And basically, what uh, Henry Lincoln says is the star is a representation of Venus, which really uh, comes down to the principle of the divine feminine. This is also a uh, premise within Zena Halpern's book that uh, she also makes the uh, assertion that the divine feminine or goddess worship was one of the reasons why the Templars went to Oak Island. Now, as far as the Da Vinci Code and uh, Zena Halpern's theory, I'm still out on a decision on that. Uh, I don't find a, a lot of Henry Lincoln's uh, logical connections to uh, Mary Magdalene being uh, the wife of Jesus and everything. I'm not quite convinced of that. There's not really a whole lot of evidence to support it except for the theory that he puts forth as far as the Divine Feminine. But uh, the one thing that really comes out in this whole uh, thing is the Divine Feminine and what it means. And in Europe, at approximately the middle of the 1200s, or the middle of the 13th century, there was called what was called the Inquisition. And the Inquisition was a time where the Catholic Church was trying to root out the Cathars or anybody, and Cathars are mainly the main focus of uh, a lot of the history in the, uh, the south of France, the Lambedoc region, where they were basically trying to root out the heretics, which were the Cathars. And there's some debate about whether the Cathars really existed or whether they didn't exist. I personally believe they did exist. I think there's more evidence showing that there was an actual group of people that were organized and starting up a religion that was basically Gnostic in its origins and Gnosticism is not really a religion, it's more of a philosophy that came down from Plato, and it uh, went through the, the Middle East, up into the Turkey area, that's 
uh, the northern part of perhaps the Middle East, and it came across into Europe uh, through various different uh, philosophies, Machneism uh, and Bogalism, and these are all Gnostic philosophies. And it was starting to flourish in the middle of the 1200s. Now, Catharism is, and this is the Languedoc, this is the region of southern France where they were uh, basically most organized. And it was during about the 1200s, the early 1200s to the um, into really the mid 1200s, they started really going through and and rounding these people up, and most most of the time they ended up killing them. So they were dualists, and their central belief system was basically the the dualistic of a good god and a bad god, and they believed that the good god was that of the New Testament or Jesus Christ, but they didn't really believe in Jesus Christ. They believed in the what they call the divine spark or the divine feminine, which Jesus Christ emulated in his sort of ethereal life. And this is a very interesting, I'm not going to go really deep into the religious aspects of the Cathars, but there's one thing that I'm going to bring out in the Cathars is that their dove, the dove, was a symbol that was used by the Cathars. And this was to denote the Holy Spirit or the divine spark. And the divine spark is the good within. And the Cathars really also believed that the material world was evil. And this right here up in the upper uh, right here in the upper right hand corner this is an actual artifact that is found in uh, Maltazir which is basically the last place it was a mountaintop where they were eventually surrounded by the Catholic Church and they were surrounded and either were able to give up and swear allegiance to the church or die and many of them died. And there's a lot of other mysteries that a treasure was taking out and everything like that. But I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the Here's a, another picture of it with a more official. Um, this is one of the few artifacts, Cathar artifacts that are found. Now, the symbolism is important in uh, what I'm showing here is we have now the symbol of a dove, okay? And this is a, one of the main symbols of the Cathar religion. So there are many other different religions within the land, uh, the land of Buc Duc, uh, region of France. There was uh, also Gnostic other religions within Germany and Poland, and they were all being rooted out. And it wasn't just French people, it was uh, Muslim people, it was Jewish people, and they all had their, uh, basically their own uh, Gnostic or Gnosis uh, philosophy or, or way of belief system that they followed. And the Catholic Church was out to root out all of them. In Ju Judaism, it was... Uh, People that were following the Zohar, they were also uh, the beginnings of what we call Kabbalah, and Jewish mysticism was very prevalent at that time coming up, and uh, there was all kinds of different things. One thing about Gnostics and Gnosticism is there's a good and there's a bad side, or there's a left or a right side. Some were looking for the inner truth spirituality, and some were looking for a more uh, worldly aspect to Gnosis, which encompassed magic and sort of divinations, knowing the future, uh, uh, turning uh, base metal into gold, the seek for the philosopher's stone, and things like that, uh, seeking eternal life. 
which may be attributed to like Holy Grailism and what people um, at that time might have thought the Holy Grail was, was the, uh, the seeking after the elixir that would give eternal life. So the Inquisition basically started around the, in the beginning of the 1250s. So around the time when I would say uh, the Templars were starting to really start to go downhill in the Middle East, they've had several crusades. Uh, the Islamic nations uh, were really starting to get a lot of steam underneath them and getting more people to come in and more warriors. And they were struggling to have their strongholds. And, you know, at the end of this century, they end up basically losing Jerusalem and, and losing it. But the Catholic Church was basically um, looking at heresies and conducting trials. And during this time, uh, it basically, this first inquisition ended at the time when the Cathars were fully suppressed. And uh, this was pretty much at the end of the uh, 13th century, 12, uh, 1295. And then shortly after that, it was the Templars that were actually thrown into this mix. Now, were the Templars Gnostics? Were they people that were basically starting to leave the traditional Orthodox religion of the Catholic Church and get into some of the more uh, Gnostic philosophies and belief systems that were really flourishing in uh, Europe, especially in southern France at the time, and Italy? In my opinion, yes. I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say yes. I think some of them were starting to become sympathetic to some of the populations, and they were learning a lot. Remember, these guys were all over the place. They were in the Middle East. They were in, uh, up in Turkey and Constantinople, and they had a very broad experience, human experience, of different cultures and different religions. So uh, one of the things, too, is if you notice, there's a heresy that's called the uh, spiritual Franciscans, and we'll see that more. And these are Franciscans that basically uh, did not believe in what uh, Francis of Assisi with his regard to uh, poverty. And a lot of these uh, Cathars and the new spiritual Franciscans, they were very much on the side of the poor, and they are very much seeing the, uh, the evil of the feudal system of Europe and the feudal system being worked by the uh, Catholic Church and how the Catholic Church was so ingrained into the state and how the policies and how the people were treated and controlled. So it's, it's interesting uh, that the Inquisition is something that could have been a mechanical device that basically inspired some of the Templars, and not just the Templars. I would say also the... Um, show you. Here's a picture, and these gentlemen are being ready to be burned, and this is the insignia of the Knights Hospitaller. Now, the Knights Hospitaller, they had their roots, and basically one of their biggest headquarters, in the county of Toulouse, which is where René Le Chateau is. And one of the people that was very much involved with the Knights Hospitaller and very, very involved with the Cathar movement, at least sympathetic to them, was Raymond, let me get this bigger here, Raymond VI, who was the governor of that area. And 
he was actually excommunicated from the Catholic Church, and it really grieved him up until his death. And apparently he died of a stroke, and he came back home, or he started to make his way home. And apparently, the way I read the story goes, is that the Knights Hospitaller came to his house uh, to see how he was, and he had already dead, was passed away, and they threw it there, this insignia on a cape over him. And this is symbolic for them, for the Knights Hospitaller, that he was a brother. He was a brother in the Knights Hospitaller. So if you read this, it says, later the Hospitaller separated Raymond's head from the body. And it says, witnesses in 1377 and 1517 note that the bones of the count were abandoned in a corner scattered here or there. But the head was kept for at least four centuries with the treasures of the Grand Priory. Now, notice how they say Grand Priory. Now, I know the Priory of Zion is connected with, you know, the Da Vinci Code and all that. But there is a term Priory that is connected with the Templars and the Knights Hospitaller. It's a play, It's basically a house of a fraternal organization that's somewhat connected to the church because there's spiritual oversight over the priory. But the priory of Zion could be a real term, and it could have been a real place. And unfortunately, it, it got its taint in the 1950s when um, Pierre Plantard uh, claimed that he was part of the priory of Zion and also through the uh, Da Vinci Code and through uh, the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Priory of Zion took on a whole new meaning. But it could have been just a priory, uh, basically the start, because Zion is in Jerusalem. Mount Zion is just south of the Temple Mount. And it could be that that is where they headquartered when they are in Jerusalem. Maybe there was a headquarter, and it was called the Priory of Zion. But if you read on further, uh, it, why they kept the skull was because it had a lily mark uh, by uh, nature of the bone. And according to Nicholas Ber Bertrand, uh, this guy right here, uh, the, it was proof of some divine planning or destiny within his life. So they gave him sort of a sainthood kind of uh, status. And Raymond VI was uh, basically uh, one of the people that was very sympathetic to the Cathars, to the Gnostic belief system. And that is why uh, they were why he was ex excommunicated. So, a lot of interesting things here. The Priory, the Skull, and if you remember, the Knights, Hus or the Knights Templar were said to have, uh, one of their allegations against them uh, was that they were worshipping a skull. So, perhaps, maybe, this is one of the reasons why that came up. Now, they weren't worshipping it, but they did perhaps venerate it at one point. So uh, this was back in the late 1200s. And this also, if, if you look at this right here, this is region, this Occitan region. This is a language, and that's important uh, to remember in your research. But uh, this right here are definitely is a picture of some Knights Hospitaller getting burnt at the stake. So were the Knights Hospitaller, were they Cathars or were they Gnostics? Definitely, it is my opinion that a lot of these men were disillusioned by what was happening and they were starting to develop new systems or new uh, allegiances to at least their spiritual lives. So, the next thing I want to get into is um, the symbology. 
and the symbology and we the this right here is uh the what they're called is stonemason symbols or marks and we saw this on the curse of oak island episode where they showed this mark right here and every stonemason had their own mark okay and these marks were very um they were like a signature and they what they were used for as they were used for symbols to get paid so if this was on the rock that they had then they would get paid for that rock and if you notice here here's the symbol that looks similar to the one that was on the uh, the page of the right here which is on the the document that was from uh, Henry Lincoln right here so I didn't want to get too far away and not bringing out the symbology because this is the symbology does have a lot of clues and we did see the um, the basically the the church in um, Portugal, Tomar, that had the uh, the different uh, symbols on it. So let's take a look, and I'm going to go all the way over here, and I'm going to go, and this is the church that they were at. Okay, see, there's the church, and you can see that it is called the, basically this is the, uh, the Church of Romanesque of, and this fonte means either source or fountain. And I don't know what Arcata is, but it sort of sounds like Arcadia. Now, I'm going to ask Corian tonight uh, on Saturday, and Corian will be on the, uh, Quest of Oak Island show this Saturday night at 8 o'clock. And it will be interesting to ask him about how what this means here. Because as we remember uh, from the uh, Henry Lincoln, he finds that et in Arcadia. And Arcadia is a, a mythological place uh, where I think a lot of uh, myths developed but this is uh, the church and where it is and you can see that it's very close I mean not so close it's about 800 miles and this is the castle of Tomont which is the castle of Tomont is mentioned on the Rochefoucauld map and the Rochefoucauld map uh, says uh, the little lion of Tomount, which uh, Gretchen Cornwall has attributed the little lion of Tomount as being Louis I, who lived in the mid to late uh, 14th century. Now, we go here to this, and this is a commandery also of the Knights Templar. And their insignia is this. This is the insignia for, or it was found near here, I would say. But they have uh, determined that it was the stamp or the symbol of the Knights Templar commandery in this area. So let now that we got that symbolism, let's uh, go back and we'll go back to Portugal and let's look at this. Here is the church that where they went on uh, the Oak Island show. And if you notice here, you know it's got the the moon and it also has this. 
Now this is a seven points, and this really denotes not a star, but the sun. And I know that this symbol here in the middle is the uh, symbol in alchemy for gold, but it also has other meanings too, and less materialistic meanings. You got to remember, a lot of these Gnostics were more about the inner than they were the outer. The material world, at least for Cathars, was evil. And the inner world was where you found the source through the divine spark. And the divine spark came from the divine feminine. And the circle here in early Gnostic teachings is the symbol of. Basically, the union between the divine masculine, which is the outer ring, and the center dot, which is the divine feminine. And it denotes, basically, the eternal source of uh, life. So, we have the eternal source of life within this radiant, which is basically a uh, denotion or symbolic gesture of illumination or the light with the uh, cross of the Templars and we also find that the Sun also contains the the eternal source uh, the eternal source symbol which means that the Sun was basically a source of life and this goes back to the Egyptians with the dynasty of Akhenaten, who, was a, who changed Egypt to be sun worshippers, because the sun was a source of life. And this, I believe, is also carried through in Kabbalah's, Kabbalism, and is ba basically one of the symbolic uh, allegories of the source. And the divine feminine and masculine, and the dualistic nature of a lot of the systems that were emerging at this time. Now, the uh, the half moon, we always attribute the star and the half moon to Islamic, but it wasn't really till later. They actually took it from, uh, I think, the Knights Templar. And the Islamic... Uh, use of the moon and the star is not real modern, but it was used by other cultures way before they did. And the, the sun or the moon and the star is basically the waxing of the moon, which represents the, uh, the growth of the divine feminine, and then the star is the source. So, uh, let's see. I also have, let's see, it's up here. Okay, so in this, in Portugal, we have the Portuguese Templars, and this is a really good article, and I'll leave a link in the descriptions is this shows all the history of the, the Templars coming to Tomar and setting up the, uh, the commandery through the new order, which is the Order of Christ, or the Knights of Christ, and the Order of Avi, and the, the, basically the union between the commandery in Portugal, which is to be the new home of basically the Knights Templar under the new name called the Order of Christ. And I think this has a very significant, if you notice, the king uh, dies, this King Di Dynast dies, but he's the one that brought them in. Uh, king Dynast was the ones that brought them in, and they... Develop, were developed in uh, Tomar, 
<clears throat> and in here, I believe it says that they were under Bennett, spiritual guides under the, uh, I think, Cisterian monks. And the Cisterian monks were very important in that they were, they were one of the uh, monk orders that really had the technology to, to do what has been done on Oak Island or uh, hope, hopefully that has been done on Oak Island with all the underground tunnels and use of hydraulics and planning and everything like that. The Cisterian monks were really the order to get that done. And I know uh, maybe you can read it. I, I can't remember where it is, but uh, it says somewhere in this article that they were under the uh, spiritual guide of the Cisterian monks. And one of the things that is really interesting is it wasn't until later, and you go back to the Inquisition, because it didn't stop at the end. It went on. And the Inquisition actually went into Spain, and then it went into Portugal. And a lot of it was they were trying to find Christian sects that were not in compliance with the Orthodox Church. They were also after uh, crypto-Jews, which uh, crypto means that they were Jewish people that were pretending to be Christian in order to escape the Inquisition. But their belief system was not Christian. It was uh, more of Jewish mysticism, which is really uh, the study of the Zohar and Kabbalah. And the uh, crypto uh, Muslims who were more in line with uh, basically the the more traditional philosophical Gnostics like uh, that would be in Manichaeism or uh, Plato or even uh, the uh, well, the one that came after Plato was the I can't remember it. But, you know, there was a lot of other things that they're, they're uh, after people who were uh, practicing witchcraft in Portugal. And, you know, witchcraft is really misunderstood in that it is not so much a, a, a gnosis of spiritual enlightenment, so to speak, but it is uh, more of a, a looking into the, the Gnostic view of, of the magic and the workings of the universe through magic to attain certain goals. And the Portuguese uh, Inquisition was very much after uh, those kinds of, of heretics. But they also were looking into, and I'm trying to find it here, is the, it was one group that came out, and it was called the Cult of the Holy Spirit. Now, the cult of the Holy Spirit is, and its symbology is the dove. So does that ring a bell? And the cult of the Holy Spirit was much like the Cathar religions. Matter of fact, it's my opinion that these were Cathars that found their way through Spain and into Portugal and were starting to... Uh, you know, live a life. But one of the things that they, where they lived, their main camp was in the Azores on an island. And they were devotion, devoted to the Holy Spirit. And they were basically, they were still very dualistic. And it doesn't really tell much about their thing, their belief systems like the Cathars, but it was very... But if you look... They were dominant, a dominant theory 
and they were in Portugal, and Elizabeth, this is the wife of the king who brought the Templars into Tomar. And the cult's principal center of devotion was in Tomar. Okay, and it says, which was also the location of the priory of the Order of Christ, charged with the new with the spirituality of discovering new lands, including the Ozars. So these uh, this cult or this I'm not I don't like to say cult, this belief system, these groups of people were actually being guarded by the night the order of Christ. And I'm trying to find out where I saw that. But the does it say here? So the order of Christ, I saw it in here, and that's the problem with research is I find stuff and then I can't relocate it. But these live together, and maybe it was in this. So... I'm sorry about this. I wanted to show you where I found that, but I can't seem to find it again. I have so much information here. But the... Maybe it was up here. I know that the I know I read in here that the order of Christ or the Templars, the old Templars, were actually they were to protect. They were under that the 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 cult of the Holy Spirit or these Holy Spirit Church was in protection from with the order of Christ. And I know I read it here somewhere, but I can't find it. But you can see that they were in Tomar. They were in uh, this area of uh, Portugal. And this was something that was very uh, revealing to me that the the, the Gnostic religion and the Order of Christ were actually very sympathetic to one another. They were very, uh, I think, protective of each other, and I believe they assimilated into this uh, type of belief system. Now, this this belief system also comes from the Franciscans. And remember we had talked about before the spiritual Franciscans were actually uh, considered heretics. And they were also uh, this kind of uh, mentality of the divine Holy Spirit and what it meant. So when we get into this woman, she was the queen that basically started, and you can see she was married to the king, that King uh, Dennis, who was also the king that brought the uh, Knights Templar into um, into the uh, fray of Portugal. So, from France, we go with Renlene Chateau, which all this area here, all this area right in here in France, the Languedoc area, was all changing. And 
those people migrated through Spain and some of them ended up up here in the northern portions of Portugal. And the Order of Christ definitely was something that was uh, Knights Templar, and I think Knights Hospitaller. I think all the people that were trying to escape the Inquisition of the Catholic Church uh, that wanted a new life after the Templars were brought down in 1307, I think went here reorganized. And also Portugal was pretty much uh, cut off uh, from France and the church. They had Spain here, which was very somewhat beholding to the Catholic Church from time to time. Uh, they became stronger as time went on into the 16th century. But uh, this also relates to uh, England, because Portugal in 1397 were allies with England. And another thing about Portugal, too, is all their really all their uh, heredity and their um, I guess you could say ancestry is Celtic. It's either Proto-Celtic or Celtic, and Celts are known to be very prevalent within Ireland and Scotland. So Portugal being a ally to England in 1397 is very much in line with other theories that, especially with the Henry Sinclair, who may also have been somewhat of a spiritualist or a Gnostic, who also uh, wanted to do this journey to Oak Island, and why would they do it? And what did they hide there? Well, why they went there, it's obvious. You know, they went there for the same reasons that a lot of Americans immigrated to the United States for freedom, for a new start on life, and to basically uh, do the things that I would think in later centuries were written about by a man named Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon would have been totally into what the, uh, the Gnostics and the Cathars were about. And uh, he may have uh, embraced maybe more the uh, left side of the Gnostic belief system uh, as his mentor John Dee and Edward Kelly did. But I still think that uh, his ideals and what he was looking for was in line with what these people probably had. Now, what do they have? I don't know. I, I don't even want to speculate. But if they were Templars and they did come out of Jerusalem, uh, it could be that they had uh, different relics of some kind that meant something to them uh, and or meant something to Gnosis. Now, I think they wanted to hide them on Oak Island. I don't think they wanted to bury them to never be found. If they did, why didn't they just dump them in the sea, take a boat out and dump them into the sea? Nobody would have ever been able to find them then. No, I think they were buried on Oak Island to be retrieved at a later day when they were ready to start their new future in the new world. Unfortunately, I don't think the expedition that put this together uh, in whole made it back. And there's lots of reasons for that. And I'm sorry I couldn't find that in here. I know if you want to do your research on your own uh, about the cult of the Holy Spirit. I know they were on the Azor Islands. Now, one thing about the Azor Islands, too, is remember they found those cannonballs on Oak Island? They said that they were from the Azor Islands. So this is something that also can be connected to Portugal and the Knights of Christ, because I know 
in here somewhere, and I read it. I'm sorry I can't find it. That the order of Christ was basically protecting these people from uh, whatever, you know, from being taken or whatever. I wish I could find it. All right. Well, that's it for now. I hope it was enough. I it's uh, it's a challenge to present all this information, but we do go away with uh, some certain certainties and links, and those are you know the belief system of perhaps the Knights Templars and the people of Portugal, and also that the the uh, geometry at Oak Island is possibly... Well, let me show you guys some things here. I'm going to show you some geometry. So we have the, uh, the cross, Nolan's cross, okay? So that's a Christian symbol. Okay, and then through the uh, Rashvakal map, the Rashvakal map we used, let's see. Well, we came up with the final image. This was early on in, uh, where we have the connection of the extension triangle, cone C, down here to these offshore points, and we have valve D, and we have the symbology of the sun, the earth, and this pyramid, and we also have the moon underneath here, and this there. And then if we add the star, which we had there, we can, uh, we can basically see We can see that the crescent moon and the star is there also. So we got the crescent moon and the star on Oak Island. I don't want to go that far, but this star not being, you know, equilateral, because these this is the north anchor out here. I don't have it on there, but this is the north anchor. You know, I don't want to go that far and say that it's a symbol of Baphomet, Baphomet, because the Templars were accused of, of worshiping Baphomet. But the icon of Baphomet, uh, I don't think the symbology of it being a star was yet done. So, although it does look like a sort of like a goat's head there. But this is the star, the moon, and we have the tree of life, which is Kabbalah. And if you remember, the uh, Rashvakal map goes through the severity and victory stone and the mercy and glory stone, which sets up this whole thing. And we have the harmony right here, which is cone D. And what was the other one? And the pyramid. So we have quite a bit of basically mystic symbology in the geometry of Oak Island, at least in our theory, uh, that all equates to all the points that are on the Rochefoucauld map. So, well, it's been a long one. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. I'll talk to you later.